that I would want to know about, because we talk about these things on a daily basis, but to do it in a more professional setting, to do it in more of a setting where we can communicate with a lot of people, communicate concerns, um, I think it's really beneficial for the whole community. So I'm really excited you guys are here and that you care about your dog so much, you want to learn more. It's like what we love in our customers the most. You know, more than you having any knowledge of dogs, just you caring enough to learn and to listen to us. Um, all the research I've done in this um, presentation is from the FDA, from JAVA, which is the Journal of American Veterinary Medical Association, and then um, scientific articles. So all of my research has been done on the um, basis of really good places to get information, not just Wikipedia or Google. So I wanted to get that out of the way as well. So this is seminar on dilated cardiomyopathy, which is DCM. And it sounds super complicated, super scientific, but I wanted to break it down for you guys because it's really going to break it down pretty easy. So dilated, almost like you dilated people, right? It's like opening. Cardio relates to the heart. Bio means muscle, and pathy means degradation. So it's kind of like the heart muscle is dilating and not becoming, is becoming less strong than it was. So that's really what the big complicated term means, is just that the heart is weakening and so the blood flow that the heart deals with is not as good as it once was. So you can see here, disease of the heart muscle causing an enlarged heart in general. Um, and that's harder to pump the blood. If blood is so important, it goes to all your organs, it carries the oxygen to your brain. The heart, we know the heart and the brain are like the two most important organs we need to show. There are breeds who are genetically predisposed, so just because of the breed they are, they can have this issue at more at higher rate than other breeds. And the list goes on, but the ones that I see the most in my research are Dorman Nature, Gold Retriever, um, Great Dane, a lot of large breeds in general. The two smaller breeds that I see a lot are Copper Spaniels and Bulldogs. So most of this issue mostly is in large breed dogs, genetically. Okay, so most people are visual learners, so I wanted to show you kind of what happens in the heart. So this is a normal heart, and then you can see here the difference in how thick this is compared to this. And then this one is what happens most in cats. So if any of you have cats, DCM has been pretty much eradicated, but this is the one that tends to happen in cats. Um, so I put that there as kind of like a fun fact. But this is what it looks like, and you would think like, oh, a bigger heart. You know, you get you get more efficient, it might be better, but really you want to think of it almost as like a hose. You know how you played with a hose as a kid, when you put your thumb over it, and suddenly the pressure was really high and you could spray your siblings or something. So that's what happens when your heart gets smaller, when your vessels get smaller, the blood pressure will go up. Now, the opposite will happen with dilation, which happens in this issue. When you dilate, the pressure goes way down. Right? So you just barely get a trickle coming out of the hose, and you want a happy medium for your heart. So that's why this is a definite issue. It's a really horrible disease that you don't want your dog to get. So it totally makes sense why people are concerned about it. Now, how many dogs have been affected by the ones that have been reported to the FDA? Because there's different groups of DCM, and I'll explain that in a second. So in about in five years, it was about 500 cases that was sent to the FDA from veterinary cardiologists. And the American Veterinary Medical Association guesstimates about 77 million pet dogs in the US. So that means that 0.00669% of the whole US population is affected by this disease um, in the context that we're talking about. So I'm going to explain that in the next one. In this one, I'll show you. There's three tiers. There's genetic, there's taurine deficiency cause, and then there's this unknown one that were, that they were kind of trying to tie into grain free. So it's not even all DCM. It's just this one group of DCM that it was, doesn't seem like it's genetic, it doesn't seem like it's taurine issue. So that's what that um, percentage is relating to. It's just this that they're trying to tie into grain free foods. So this is a tiny, tiny percentage, right? Like every time you move a decimal, it goes a tenth, a hundredth, a thousand. So it's a tiny, tiny percent of the dogs that are in this category. Whereas when you compare that to something like obesity or cancer, and a very specific type of cancer, this is a specific disease, so we want it to be fair in our comparison. Lymphoma affects about 70,000 dogs annually. That's 0.5%. So that's only a tenth of a decimal point, where the other one was over a thousand. 
So it really kind of puts things into perspective where if people are worried about this but not worried about obesity or cancer or you know, all these other issues that we see a lot more, um, it's kind of putting it into perspective so you can realize what issues you should concentrate on first. And if you're both genetically predisposed, that's like another story. You can kind of be worried about that. But overall, these things are something you should think about first. We know that over half of dogs are overweight in the U.S. And that's just those, that leads to so many other issues, you know, arthritis, diabetes, um, other certain cancers are more likely. So these are things we should be focusing our attention on. The National Cancer Institute, approximately 6 million new cancer cases are introduced yearly. So these are big issues that I would argue with someone who's so like, consumed about DCM. You'd be like, you should worry about the more common things, because it's more likely that you're actually going to get that. It's more likely that that's something you want to prevent. So what causes DCM? We kind of talked about a couple things. Obviously, genetic mutation in certain breeds, taurine deficiencies. We're going to talk a lot about taurine towards the end of my section, and then hypothyroidism and heart muscle inflammation or disease. So if the dog has disease already, it can lead to DCM. Um, then it's pretty rare in cats, like I said, because taurine supplementation became a big thing in the uh, late 1980s. So once that was introduced, pretty much all cases of DCM in cats went away. So taurine was the main issue for cats, and um, it's also an issue for dogs. Okay, so this is a lot of words, but this is straight from the very first article that uh, everyone kind of freaked out about. So it was in JAMA, which is that Journal of American Veterinary Medical Association. So that journal is very well known, very regarded, well. Um, so basically, veterinary cardiologists had an impression it's not scientific, right? Like that's not that's not qualitative, that's not quantitative, that's just an impression. That they were diagnosing DCM in golden retrievers specifically um, at higher rates than expected. But we know golden retrievers do have a genetic predisposition. But they're just saying, oh, we had kind of more than we were expecting, and then some in dog breeds that we did not know have a genetic issue. So that's really what this whole thing is founded upon, is that some cardiologists just thought that there was another Thing that they were that they didn't know about, and it was seemingly that a lot of these dogs were being fed grain free. So none of this is based on actual science. It's just kind of like objectively what these cardiologists were seeing, and so they're reporting it to the FDA just in case it was an issue. Um, so they list a bunch of foods. We're talking kangaroo, bison. They list like 12 to 20 foods that these dogs were like readily eating. And in there, we see, we see lentils, peas, fava beans, tapioca, and then barley. So they're listing a grain along with all the other grain-free ingredients, all the other bag ingredients. And bag is boutique, exotic, and grain-free. That's what that stands for. So it was interesting that they um, put a grain in there when they're trying to tie the issue to grain-free foods. And then uh, right here, they have low plasma or whole blood taurine concentrations. Some of the dogs that were reported actually had taurine issues. So it wasn't that it was completely unknown cause. They also had taurine issues. They were just eating the grain free, so they still reported it. They improved with a taurine supplementation and a diet change. And some of these dogs went from grain free to grain free. Not all of them went back to grain. So it's not scientifically correct to make that conclusion that grains fix them, especially where taurine was supplemented in all dogs regardless. So the ones that had normal plasma or whole blood protein or whole blood taurine concentrations also improved with the same treatment. So it is kind of interesting in that way that they weren't consistent in any of the dogs to actually pull any data from. It was just kind of like they treated every dog the same and some got better, some didn't, some were um, giving grain free, some weren't. So it really is just not stable in any way. So we saw this uh, earlier, right? So this is the one we're concentrating on for right now, and then we're going to, to go into the taurine deficient section towards the end. Um, this is still 2018. It is, uh, the FDA did an article after the JAMA article because people were wanting to know what they had to say. And basically, the whole gist of it is a direct quote from their article. It is not yet known how these ingredients are linked to cases of DCM. So that shows you that this article, while everyone assumed that it was fact and proven, it was not. There was no link 
no science behind it. It was just kind of a thing that vets were seeing and getting a little worried about that had no base, really. But JAMA, in their um, article, they posted this. For dogs in which possible diet-associated DCM is diagnosed, we recommend the owner change the diet to one made by a well-established manufacturer that contains rice, corn, and wheat. So if there's no link to grain free, if there's no scientific tie, um, there is no conclusion really at all besides we don't know. Why are they making a recommendation for something that is not an issue that we know what it's causing? It's kind of unscientific. A doctor would not recommend a medication to you when they don't know what's wrong with you, right? That's kind of what I think. Um, and then right here, they also emphasize, we also emphasize that changing to a raw or clean prepared diet may increase the risk of other nutritional deficiencies. We'll talk a little bit about raw a little bit later, but the issue here too is that they're completely taking out your power to feed raw and home food just because it may be unbalanced. But what if it is balanced? What if the food we sell is AFCO completely balanced? So what if it is balanced? They don't go into any information with that either. They just say, oh, maybe it's balanced, so you shouldn't feed it. But if it is balanced, it would be a good solution to this issue. But they don't go into that because they have issues with raw. And then this is also something that I found an issue with this first article. The doctors who wrote it all have a bias towards big grain companies. And when you write a scientific article, at the very bottom, if you have some sort of bias or some sort of relation that you would benefit from this article monetarily or in other ways, you have to list it. So this is directly taken from that JAMA article. So all of them have received research support from Purina. All of them. All three of them. The other one, these two, have also received research support, support from Royal Canaan, which is another grain free big, big brand. And then Dr. Freeman has actually consulted with Purina, has given sponsored talks for Hills Pet Nutrition and Purina. So we see a lot of bias in the people who wrote this article. Now they're all they're all doctors, they're all vets, and even Dr. Freeman specializes in nutrition. But this bias cannot be ignored, and that's why they make you put it at the bottom of the article. Which I am curious, have any of you actually read this article, the 2018 article? <laughs> yeah, I was just curious. Um, so here's the 2021 update, and this is the benefit of having this seminar later than when we were going to have it in 2020 before COVID, um, is that we have updates now that we, weren't, we wouldn't be able to share if it was a year ago. Okay, so the FDA has received reports of the non-hereditary DCM associated with both grain-free and grain diets. So this is directly taken from the FDA website as well. Um, it's important to note that legumes and peas and the type of carbohydrates that they are using in grain free food have been used for years and have not seen inherent issues with it. Like, that's directly from the FDA saying, and they also say they have not taken any regulatory action against any specific diet or brand still to this day. And actually, Zoe was in a meeting with the American Veterinary Association. Yeah. Yeah. So I was in a Zoom call meeting this last April with the American Vet Association where they went on and they said that the FDA has now pulled themselves from any studies relating back to dilated cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. So they are not even a part of it anymore. So and I was that was really a cool experience to be able to hear that from the American Vet Association. So Yeah. So basically what they're saying is that this is gonna probably gonna be the last update from the FDA with this issue. There's still research being done about different carbohydrates, different issues that cause DCM genetic issues, right? Because these breeds that we're seeing DCM in that we don't know what genetic issue is, like in their breed line, we just may not have, not have found it yet. So there's still research being done on that. Now this is from JAGMA, which is the 2018 article where it's from. This is a 2020 update. So this was taken directly from them. Dr. George Collins, who is president of Missouri-based Nutrition Solutions, suggested increased reports of DCM may be related to other factors. We know that. But he says specifically, such as overfeeding in dogs or recent genetic mutations that could affect dogs' ability to metabolize glucose. So really, now we're just seeing a lot of people trying to find the solution. And grain free is seemingly to be forgotten in, as the time has gone by. But the damage we know has been done because we have been here every day calming people about this issue, helping people like through it with the information that we have gained from our research. So 
the damage was done. It blew up on social media and all of that. And it's really unfortunate that brain three gets such a bad rap from a specific issue when there's no scientific base to it at all. So it's really unfortunate. And then I have some st statistics down here. So over the past 10 years, there's been a 158% increase in the number of overweight dogs. That is a big number. Overweight dogs and obesity is a big issue now. And so these DCM cases starting to show up where we don't understand why. That would make sense. Other issues are related, right? We know the heart is affected when a dog is overweight. So it could totally be related to that. They just don't have uh, research back um, yet. So it takes time. You know, research takes time, studies take time. And then this one makes me so sad. As many as 37% of all dogs are overweight by the time that they're six months old. So usually if the dog goes home at two months or three months, that's only three or four months that a person has a dog that they have fed them way too much and then they're overweight. And that affects their growth plates and so many other things, but this is not a presentation about obesity. We can do that. <laughs> I would be happy to do that. Okay, and then we have another quote from Dr. Teresa DeFrancisco. It's flawed data, it's retrospective. So you're seeing an actual doctor, a professor of cardiology, and clinical care at the North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine, calling out the 2018 article for the data that they gave. It's fully retrospective, it's absolutely flawed. Um, so people in this field have now started to call out the issues. Um, and then, of course, you mentioned that continued research does need to be done. We all know that, because we don't have an answer. There's still no answer. All right, so let's talk about taurine deficiency. Now, taurine is an amino acid, and it's absolutely essential to heart health. Um, now, this is one that has been absolutely linked to DCM. It, uh, so an amino acid is a building block of a protein. Proteins are made up of multiple amino acids twisted into a certain shape. So this is just one of the amino acids. It aids in the strength traction of heart muscles. So when the heart weakens, right, this is something that strengthens the muscles. So this is how it's preventing DCM, uh, touring this. Um, also reduces the stress response and stabilizes the blood pressure. And then this is like the makeup of touring. You can see that this S stands for sulfur. So sulfur is one of the main um, things in touring. The O's are oxygen, hydrogen, and then the nitrogen. So this is kind of an organic chemistry view of taurine. So we know sulfur is very important. Okay, so taurine is most highly found in muscle meats, heart, eggs, and seafood. It's also been supplemented in the food brands we carry. So since this became an issue in 2018, all of the brands we carry now supplement taurine into their foods to make sure a dog is getting enough taurine, just in case it was an issue. Um, to really help heart health. There was no research done before that to, for them to add it in, and adding a nutrient in without any base could actually be harmful. So that's why it was this point that they started to add taurine. So you know you're getting taurine if you buy from us, for sure. I can't speak for other food brands that we don't carry, um, but also if you feed raw or if you want to put stuff on top of your dog's food, we know that these four ingredients are the ones that have a lot of taurine in them. And also, it's interesting that uh, they would say, oh, feed rice, corn, and wheat, or like a food with those, when these are the ones that are good for taurine, right? We know taurine is linked to DCM, so why would they put those ingredients on if they're not linked to helping the taurine issue, right? We know that um, Royal Canin and Purina and all those brands don't have heart, eggs, and seafood very often. And we know the muscle meats that they do use are low quality and probably um, the byproduct rather than not even muscle meat. Byproduct is like the beef and the peppers and low quality. But you're into the analysis. To make sure you have good taurine in your dog's food, you want a high animal-based protein, and um, that's rarely found in standard diets, right? So they might have a protein, but it's not gonna be necessarily from animals. It could be from plants, and that's a lot harder to digest. Again, plants aren't really listed right here as well. So you want that, and then heart quality equals higher nutritional content. Taurine is a nutrient, so high quality is really what you're looking for here. And you can do high quality on a budget. That's what we specialize in. We work with so many people with different budgets, and we can always find something that works for you, but is also the best for your dog. And we've gotten really good at it in the years that we've been open. Um, so I went and found a couple other research articles that were related to taurine, um, and these ones were also not available prior, so I'm really glad we're doing it now because 
we would have had this research before. Um, so the title of this is Dietary Beet Pulp Decreases Taurine Status in Dogs Fed Low Protein Diet. So that low protein diet is very important because um, if you have a high protein, it's not going to affect the dogs as much. Low protein diet is tends to be the diet you find in the grocery stores. Um, everything here is going to be considered high protein in the dog world, in the dog food industry. So this is a direct quote from this study. It is known that large dogs were fed lamb meal and rice, again with the rice, are at an increased risk to develop taurine deficiency induced dilated cardiomyopathy. So why would they also recommend rice when it could cause DCM still just in the different way through the taurine deficiency? That's my question. And so the same article, so dogs synthesize taurine via the activities of two key enzymes. So this is kind of a biochemical pathway, it's a little complicated, but I will explain it pretty simply. So they use these two are enzymes. We go from cysteine, to cysteine sulfenic acid, to hypotaurine to taurine. So this is the dog's body way of going from cysteine to taurine. And they just have taurine, then they'll just use that. But some of the genetic issues start here. Like I know the Cocker Spaniels have issues with cysteine. Some of the uh, genetic issues can be at this point of the pathway, any of the points. So taurine is really important, whether it's just taurine or if it comes from its precursor cysteine. Um, and then from this article, you also see supporting evidence for the role of the gut microflora in taurine loss has been reported for other species. So it's not in dogs yet, but in rats and cats as well. It has been shown that if the gut microflora is not thriving, you can have an issue with uptake in taurine, and that can affect the heart. Gut microflora are the good bacteria in your gut that help you digest things, digest things that you're not meant to digest, and then you get the byproduct of what they make, and your body really benefits from that. So we know that microflora plays a really important role for taurine uptake, and a lot of the lower quality brands are not going to have a good probiotic that works. So that is another reason why I wonder why they would recommend a, you know, a brand with rice, corn, or wheat in it when this could also lead to DCM via the taurine induced Okay, and then this was another study that effects of different carbohydrate sources on taurine status in healthy beagle dogs. So they fed grain free and grain based and just saw how the taurine went. And after um, the thing was done, Grain-free exhibited greater increase of taurine concentrations than grain-based fed. So the dogs who were fed grain-free grain actually had better taurine supplementation in their body than grain-based. So we see that this is actually scientifically like proven. Um, overall, though, no effect of diet was observed to be um, like the, the grain-free did not cause this in a way through the taurine deficiency is what's, what that is doing. Okay, and I said we'd get to raw, so now we're in raw. So if legumes and potatoes, etc., the carbohydrates used in grain-free are the issue, how come raw diets were recommended? Raw diets very rarely have those carbohydrates of peas, legumes, potatoes. So if those are the issue, raw would be a solution. How come that wasn't listed? And then we have Dr. Karen Becker quote here, who is like one of our favorite veterinarians. She Quote, carbs can't replace meat when it comes to supplying the sulfur. Remember the sulfur in the, in the taurine? They can't come close to replacing the supply of sulfur amino acids that dogs and cats require to produce adequate amounts of taurine. So more meat is better for taurine in the body than carbs, is basically what she's saying in a simple way. So it just is really interesting that they won't list raw as a possible solution. And their, ex their excuse is that it might not be balanced. And that's all they say about it. They just, I don't think they have your dog's health in mind, truthfully. Otherwise, they would explore all routes. So now we are going to bring on Heather, right? Yes. Dr. Heather. So before we do that, I do kind of want to do like a little giveaway. We have some good giveaway baskets and prizes that we put together. and. I know there's only a few of you being here, so I want to make sure everybody gets one, which I don't know what the best way, because we have more tickets in here. Yeah, we could honestly just... Yeah, for everyone here, so... So, yeah, I mean, 
Do any of you have questions so far at all? Yeah. Uh, okay, awesome. Well, then what I'll probably do is we do have some really good giveaways. We have a beautiful basket from our Apple Journal rep, Lisa, here, as well as we do have like a couple bags from her, and we'll go into better ways to support that. Um, but I will kind of save that till the end then, um, since we don't have a ton of us here, and make sure everybody is able to get some, one of those prizes. But we do have, her name is Dr. Heather Akuff. She works with Nulo, and she is actually their brain specialist nutritionist there. And so she is on Zoom, and she just wanted to kind of give us a brief overview of a few things. So it's really awesome that she's going to join in with us. And yeah, so I will get her logged in, and then we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, so she has a master's in brain which is amazing because then she can just kind of talk to you about, in general, grain versus grain free. And we just carry grain options. We carry the highest quality of grain options that we can find for dogs who want grain. After Heather talks, Zoe is going to talk about ways to include that supports evidence of brain low risk and type 2 diabetes. Typically, that's because they are more glycemic than a possible alternative, like the updated starch. Um, the whole brain is bringing that fiber, which can lower that glycemic impact. Brains can also reduce the risk of heart disease in humans. Uh, now produced for us on small and blood pressure and be part of a healthy weight management program. But all of these benefits, we, we tend to just apply them to tax and assume the same benefit uh, will translate to a loss in tax. But that's not always the case. We don't necessarily know that all brains will have a lower risk of type 2 diabetes in dogs because that research just hasn't been done. And the same way we have purchased and blood pressure, a dog can have to be are not prone to the same type of cardiovascular diseases as food. While there are some shared diseases, and most of the benefits that we get out of bringing for pets tend to focus on reduced weight because of that kind of fiber content. But all of these other types of cardiovascular impacts are largely unknown. So that opens the door for having research to help fill in those gaps. When we break brains down into the nutritional profiles, what you're seeing here is the table of some of the nutrients in different types of brains. So we have corn and white rice across the top, and some of the more ancient, all the way to ancient brains down at the bottom. In terms of protein content, ingredients of different brains can vary the amount of protein that they have in them. Ancient brains tend to be higher in protein instead of more conventional crops. We can also look at that in terms of starch content, and the modern brain tends to be a little bit higher in starch content relative to ancient brains. And a lot of that is because of selective hybridization of the crops. In order to make them more starch producing, because we like starch in human nutrition. So that translates into a lot of these ingredients that are high in starch components in pet foods um, versus a benefit where you might be a little bit higher protein, higher fiber, lower starch profile out of the two grains. So generally speaking, even between the grains, there can be differences in the nutrients that are delivering into the pet food. Now, if we compare grains with the family to some of the other alternative ingredients in pet foods, like legumes, these would include things like our kidney beans, or lentils, or chickpeas, even soy meal, which is very popular in a lot of the large pet food brands. We can compare that to grains and see that a legume family tends to be higher in protein than grains, but it's also higher in fiber relative to grains. And these two categories of nutrients, protein and fiber, are extremely important when we look at how these can be applied into a full pet food diet and what level we would include. So you have to keep an eye on total nutrient content of the diet. Now, let's look at the ingredients on the basis that they are in elastic content. 
had spent two years to lighting, asylum, and fifteen. Also, Gideon was differ a little bit in those amino acids that they're bringing in. If you look at lysine as an example, the lipids tend to be a little bit higher in lysine relative to grain, but grain tend to be higher in the thiamine and histine than legumes. So this is where we start to think about if you have multiple plant-based ingredients in a pet food formula, you've got to think about the amino acids that they're bringing in and whether or not that's meeting the animal's nutritional requirements. When it comes to taurine, which will be a focus of, of several slides of presentation, and carnitine, these two amino acids have a very important role in cardiac health. Plant ingredients, legumes or grains, are devoid of taurine and carnitine. These are amino acids we can only get out of animal groups. So if you're looking at things like taurine deficiency, Start to focus in on all these whatever major ingredients in the food. And that's highlighted a lot of the media news and focus on grain versus grain free because of their lack of toy and some of the essential nutrients for health. Looking a little closer at taurine, this is not an that that's different from others because it's not structural. It doesn't participate in both skin synthesis, so you won't find it in muscle tissue as part of the structure of that protein chain. Instead, it's a free amino acid that tends to circulate to various tissues throughout the body. And we find it in very high concentration in things like the brain, eye, and heart in animals. And so that tells us a little bit about where it's being active in those different organs. Taurine and abophagy can be synthesized from this anxiety and cysteine that we looked at is collecting amino acids in those plant ingredients. In different enzyme pathways, we can make toys. We can make plenty of toys to be our firing. Dogs typically do as well. Cats, though, collect some of those enzymes to produce enough toys to eat their meat. So that indicates that toys have to be added to cat diet. And what we're hearing with this theory and all of the research coming out of it is that. Some dogs may have taurine deficiency tendencies, so they might need a little bit of extra taurine to help their pathway that might not be producing enough on their own. When we look at dietary sources of taurine, those are typically oily foods, um, those are the highest concentration. It can also be found in muscle meat as well as in supplemental concentrated forms, so things like a vegetarian diet we absolutely have to have some sort of synthetic form added to it in order to meet the animal food. And when we look at when we're not getting enough story, some of the key symptoms that come up are heart disease, so specifically related to cardiomyopathy. But we can also see it in our eye health, so recommendations and also blindness is very common in cats who have chronic deficiency. But there's also other ways to have this reproductive health in terms of great weight and normal central nervous system function. So when we don't do enough of that, a lot of different key processes can start to break down. When we have taurine that's coming in with the diet, uh, it, you begin with dietary protein, which is a very large complex molecule that has multiple amino acids that are used together in a chain. During the process of digestion, when it reaches the small intestine, through the digestive process of having the enzymes and bile, the means by the ball over here, we will start to break down the large protein genes into its individual amino acids. And then as the protein begins to reabsorb into the body, to the liver, um, either either used for energy production, it can be used to make the tissues or transport to other cells. But chlorine, specifically in the liver here, chlorine is used to conjugate by a salt. In order to make fire, which is essential for digestion, chlorine is the only amino acid that doesn't have to use to make the final salt and acid. In human, we use glycerin chlorine. So this makes the really unique food that you can pursue while we have glycerin to our own nutrition, and that we need that chlorine in order to have optimal digestion. And when we develop that chlorine, either to the diet, or producing enough on their own, or if they have twenty in that they're not recycled through any way of accounting for the bio fault that is returning back to the liver, then we can start to get into issues with form deficiency. 
Well, my theory is really what those are thinking of when it's relation to food. It's been a very, very big hypothesis and there's some research focus that somehow that they're not getting enough for their food or if they are, they're not recycling it. So they're losing more of it into their food. And that happens when we have a net deficiency. So the amount of corn that's either being made or eaten is less than the amount of corn that's being treated and used in the body. So we have equilibrium with your input to the output, so you don't have an issue with deficiency. So you have a pet that's at risk for corn deficiency. Typically, they'll have insufficient enzymes to make their own corn at a sufficient rate. So this is where we know from the mechanism of tax, where they're not producing enough corn to use their meat, they're also producing that as well. We might also have low concentrations of protein in the diet, so protein restriction. Um, is there on a weight less food diet, or um, is there on a city type diet where you have to have extremely low protein level? That's where we can get into the concerns of deficiency. As well as is it low in the scope of competing amino acids in the diet, so depending on what they do, so for their primary components making up the formula, the next parents indicate whether or not there's a negative precursor to support that forming pathway. The amount could be poor availability of those So, for instance, if you have highly processed ingredients or ingredients that are reacting with each other in the diet and make them less digestible, they might be present in food but less available to the pet. And then there's also the effect of losing so much corn in the feces instead of the fashion in the liver. And that is increased gastrointestinal loss, which they think or hypothesize that when you create food, you're contributing to this step two. So that was one of the leading thoughts was that when you create food, somehow you're increasing loss of the pain in the food. So that leads to a research study that shows you this is kind of fun. This is a published study, this is a collaboration. Between Penn State University and the University of Illinois. And the front said, are there differences between green and grain free foods? We have the high level of digestion. Are there differences in corn starch, or dietary starch? And are there any changes in the amount of food that's lost in species of this size, depending on the diet that we look at? So the diet is set out with a huge set of diets for the sun. One is green free, the other is green free. Both of them contain the similar amount of carbohydrates, which is roughly 50% of the formula, except the grain based formula has self, millet, and corn, and the grain free formula has vegetables, beans, and tapioca. So, showing here on the right is the table that shows the amount of each ingredient that was included in this experimental diet. And so, the only difference between them was the change out of the carbohydrate sources. So the animals to two different diets just to look at their, their nutrient composition before we even feed them into the animal. And the chemical composition of nutrient they follow is very similar in terms of total protein content because we didn't want to change the amount of protein that's involved today. They're very similar in fat content except that the green free diet tends to be a little bit lower. So when you look at dietary fiber, this is where you start to get really differences between quick base and green free. So even just a small amount of ingredients and changing out the hard sources, the green free diet is higher in fiber. Specifically higher in insoluble fiber and soluble fiber. So overall, we're getting a total sort of dietary fiber level that's going to be increased in the potatoes. With only the satellites, these are especially type of fibers that are truly changing, and these are some of those uh, fibers we use in cigarettes to follow us because they can be digested by the bacteria in the gut. So when we look at a comparison of green beans used to green free, the green free food is much, much higher in these illegal satellites. And that's because that also fiber in a green free ingredient tends to be very, very permissible. So that's on um, green beans and natural fruit, the more you eat. I'm sure most of you know that uh, old that song. That is where it's coming from because the uh, sodium foods tend to be much more fermentable in the gut. You can see that there's lots of various types of fibers that it brings in. 
So the answer to the name is just the same thing so you can get different nutrients for the files off the bat. In the amino acid categories for the differences between them, we see that there are some differences in lysine, thiamine, and cysteine, where the green tea diet is higher in lysine, but it's lower in the sulfur containing precursor to chlorine. So here, I'll give a free formula that has less of the enzymes that are used for the amino acids that are used by enzymes to create chlorine inside the body. Whereas the green tea diet tends to be a little bit higher in the and they were both very similar in taurine content. So there's a reminder, those plant ingredients don't contain taurine, so it shouldn't have very uh, low by the amino acids of the protein. Now, when we look at the digestibility data from this study, so we have fed the product to the dog over a period of three weeks, and then we measured how digestible it was. The organic matter digestibility, there was 87% in the brain and 84% in the brain free formula. So here the selective dose is significantly different. We have lower digestibility of the brain free formula, but only slightly, and a lot of that's attributed to fiber, because higher fiber formula seems to be a little bit less digestible, just by the, the definition of fiber being indigestible dietary components. The concept is little protein content, which is where our amino acid protein would be, they're very similar. So they were not any different between the two in, in terms of the statistical analysis. So even though there's a slight numerical difference, the protein digestibility is not significant or important. We also looked at the blood analysis of these dogs. So we can look at the total exploring and circulating in the blood, which is some whole blood exploring. You can also look at plasma uh, amino acids as well, which gives you some indication of where the amino acids are and what their status is in the animal. And what we found is that between brain base and brain free state, even though in brain state the taurine numerical number is a little bit higher, it wasn't enough to be statistically significant. So this looks like a big difference, but it really wasn't. And same for whole blood taurine. Even though there's some slight numerical differences here, we didn't find that totally change in their blood just because they were on a green base versus a green tree formula. The third question was looking at does green base versus green tree increase the amount of basically the totally loss in the species. Instead of just looking at totally in the species, so we look at bile acid excretion. Because these bile acids are conjugated with taurine, these can be used as an indicator of taurine loss from the animal. And what we found is that the primary bile acids, which are um, directly synthesized in the liver, they actually increase for uh, losses in the brain tree. So we saw more primary bile acids coming out in the species of the animals relative to the brain based diet. So this is an interesting finding. It supports the notion that with high fiber formula, you will get a little bit more of the bio acids getting lost in the species instead of the fertility. So this is interesting in terms of possibly being related to some of the uh, loss of cholesterol and the nutrition, which is what feeding grains or uh, feeding higher fiber foods, you can get a cholesterol lowering effect. And that's because those fibers can help to bring that uh, bile acid, which is connected to the strong metabolism in the species, and you lose a little bit more of it there. So, overall, highlights from that research and what we can take away from it is that the nutrient composition of grain free versus grain free food will be a little bit different. Grain free will give you a little bit more soluble fibers and some of those will be the fat rise of the animal, so that can be beneficial in the gut. But even though green based diets are a little bit lower in lysine, they're higher in the sulfur containing amino acids, methionine, and cysteine. And this is probably, this is not just my hypothesis, why so many veterinarians are recommending green based diets because they do have more methionine and cysteine inherently with their ingredients. But no matter what base the carbohydrates you're using in the formula, any shortages of one ingredient can be made up by using complementary ingredients and or supplementation. So it's not necessarily green versus green uh, free, it's more the total picture of the diet. 
In terms of digestibility, grain free versus grain based did not impact their total protein digestibility. Both of those diets were using hydrolyzed pork protein as the main protein source. And it was at a pretty high inclusion level of three percent for the majority of the group. Um, the group that did not have the most protein was the group that was having the most protein. Um, so it was the group that was not surprising. If you were to see a strict diet that didn't have any meat and was strictly grain or strictly grain free, you would probably start to see some of those differences between the digestibility to be more saturated. And grain free foods might have a lower apparent uh, digestibility of organic matter, and that's high for the higher fiber content. So nothing to be worried about, but it is something that can be the higher fiber level um, can be measured um, in terms of digestibility of all of the organic matter, which is all of the matter is best for the minerals in the diet. And in terms of taurine status, we didn't see any significant differences between their, their blood taurine, the binding, or cysteine levels between the two different diets. The total amount of bile acids wasn't affected by the carb sources, but we did see more primary bile acids coming out. So that indicates there could be some differences in how the bile acids are uh, interacting with the microbiome as they pass into the large intestine. And then grain free diets just generally may start to get uh, some more research studies done focusing on the metabolism that's occurring by the microbiome on these bile acids. So how the bacteria also respond to having bile acids pass through, they can digest those and plenty that as well for energy and uh, different food sources. So high level fertilizers of these DCM the consensus today with all the researchers is that it is multifactorial. It's not just caused by one issue. Um, you can have grains, you can have grain free foods. You'll have slightly different nutrient profiles. But at the end of the day, it's about finding nutritional balance using complementary ingredients and making sure that the finished product that's going to be fed to your pet is analyzed, tested, and verified, and just making sure that it has all of those essential nutrients. In a format that's available for them, so how is it processed? Um, are those nutrients uh, digestible for your pet? And consider total uh, ingredient inclusion things like fiber products with extremely high fiber bias. There's a couple of now, there's some prescription foods, for example, that might be 16 percent fiber. So there's a good thing to look out for uh, amino acid metabolism because in that case, you might get more excretion of tone just because of the higher fiber level. You want to look at making sure there's plenty of taurine in the formula and or a supplement for the DCM. And the causes of DCM you guys have talked a lot about today, I'm sure, are you know whether it's genetic or non-genetic. A lot of those are case to case, they're not all dogs to be treated the same. There's a lot of other factors like the dog's size, their breed, their age, and even what life stage they're in um, to impact their amino acid requirements. So essentially you just want to make sure that you're getting plenty of the precursors of taurine. You can get plenty of taurine itself through the ingredients or supplementation, but also looking at the total balance of your diet and what ingredients are used to make that up. With me and our company, our core nutritional values have always been using high amounts of animal-based protein. So that's our strategy and our philosophy for feeding dogs and cats, which are well equipped to use those in the last of any protein to get what they need. Because meat is a natural source of taurine, you don't tend to see high meat formula being indicated um, in taurine deficiencies with the DCM. So feeding raw meat um, in your pet's diet is a good way to get them some natural we also used low carb levels in total. So we looked at diets that have very, very high carbohydrate levels. That's where you might start to get in that they have more of those ligands or grains than the new of animal proteins. And you might start to shift some of that nutrient profile towards that high risk category where they don't have enough of the precursors that your dog may need to synthesize for me. We also use low glycemic ingredients typically across the board for our food sources that usually use low glycemic which are low glycemic to the, to the nutrition, but there's also some benefits to using some of those ancient grains. So we use things like salt and quinoa over uh, corn and white rice that might be higher glycemic. And of course we have some other functional ingredients like probiotics that can support that healthy digestive tract and microbiome, which can help to make sure that they're digesting the food as well as they can. 
And just to quickly look through the health protein content in our food, typically we have 80 to 90 percent of the protein in our food coming from meat. So that's a very high proportion of protein that is that foreign rich source. Uh, looking at other pet foods where we start to shift more towards plant and food protein, there's nothing wrong with that, so we just want to make sure that we're looking at the overall picture and whether or not you need supplementation to make sure that foreign and those foreign food sources are available for your pet. So some takeaways, I guess you guys have, you know, if you just work with the end, you can find this. It's not a grain versus grain food food problem. That tends to be the easiest answer of switch to grains and you'll avoid all the problems. But there are issues you can see that would be associated with this one we want to use grain diet as well. So you want to make sure you're looking at total nutritional composition and a good strategy is feeding higher meat, low carb only like uh, the Having your baby's in terms of the amino acid composition for the awesome um, Avoid protein restricted diets. Uh, if you can help it, I know um, I got involved with uh, stage 3 kidney disease. You have to be on a kidney uh, diet, which is very, very low protein. So, for him, I need supplementation to help make sure you're getting plenty of amino acids in your life. So, if you're not on a protein, then you should talk to the veterinarian if you have some sort of salad, particular prescription for the long run. And then pork protein quality. So uh, some of the old studies that from the 80s that came out on the East and dogs were looking at lamb in right size and they the two types of lamb being a very poor quality protein. So it just really depends on how much of those ingredients are being used to supply the protein. So it's not all or nothing. The lamb meal can be beneficial if you can a lot of high quality pet food, but it's actually full protein source and there's not very much of it. So, we could run into some potential issues. And of course, those are very high fiber levels in most of the pet that need gas. So, you know, I'm very high and talking about 10 and 15% higher, something that's well above average. You know, I want to say that they're all coming up with that. So, we can start to get into becoming a major, major, major bulking agent inside the intestine and they, you know, do some of the bile salts and the and then we consider the pet itself, so whether or not you might be prone to have a low inclined activity, uh, if there's a low stall, so the body size is being from the solar carbon. There are certain diseases for those breeds that have been identified by veterinary researchers, so depending on whether or not the dog might be in the families, uh, and that would be something you can talk to the veterinarian about. And of course, their life stage, so whether they're a puppy or if they're in more gestation lactation phase. Um, they have higher requirements, mostly for uh, low amino acids. So in that case, you might need uh, temporary supplementation if your diet doesn't have enough to meet their needs for the next specific phase. And some of that stuff, the content that we hear for you today, so if you guys come off the screen, I'd be happy to take your questions. Okay, awesome. Um, so just to kind of wrap up,
Raw food, we've talked about, holds in all those natural vitamins and minerals. It holds in all this produce that has a ton of health benefits to it in a good ratio of milk. And that's why we, when Ali said, why wasn't raw food recommended if it is completely balanced? And so we want to make sure it is that balanced raw food and that they're getting the right amount of nutrients from it. But why can't we do three out of those 14 meals a week have some form of raw in them? Or even one. And it doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing, which I'll go into a little bit more on the next couple slides. But yeah, if one of those that we could decrease the chance of processed meals, the better for them. So with a kibble fed dog, and this goes back to if you have a high quality kibble, there are ways to add things onto there to even get a couple extra nutrients in there. It doesn't have to be all raw food. But making sure you have a high quality kibble, like we talked about with that high protein quality source of it, and then adding some form of topper to that. We always talk about building a better bowl. So if you can add a topper of 100% meat, especially organ meat, or a supplement of tori, any meal that can have raw meat added will be a benefit, will benefit the dog in multiple ways and forms. So raw fed is our, our Obviously, the highest quality and will equal the best nutrients. And so, your dog's body is meant to break down raw food. Their stomach acid is so high that that pH balance is very high. It breaks down all those worries of raw pathogens and bacteria and things like that. That is what their body is meant to be breaking down on the easiest way. So, whatever way we're able to add that in is going to benefit your dog. So a couple of the things we brought down here are some products that we currently carry that are going to have ample amounts of taurine in them. They're going to be able, like ways to supplement feed and to add some good things into your dog's diet and to help build a better home. So some of those are going to be, of course, a raw based diet. We carry those in the freezer oh, right over here. Um, running a little low right now, but they're on their way to us as we speak. Um, but anything like that. A couple other things are, these are some of my favorite treats that we carry. These are called Sojo's. Um, it's a freeze-dried raw brand. And the nice thing about them is their whole bag is actually organ meat. So where this says beef, we have turkey and lamb as well. The whole bag in here is just organs. So you're able to feed quite a bit of that supplement feed. This can be a treat or a topper. Um, and it's going to have everything in it that your dog needs to supplement that taurine. A way I like to explain freeze dried is it's like cotton candy to us. That flavor melts in our mouth and we love it. That's exactly how freeze dried is for dogs. So usually they will go crazy for this stuff too. And you're able to give a lot more of these treats like throughout your day because they don't have in all a bunch of extra added calories or things like that. So these are a great way to add twine and some organ meat on top of your dog's diet. Another way that we can do this is actually a supplement of Taurine itself. So this is called Taurine Boost. It's from Herbsmith. They are a great company that use all veterinarian developed formulas of herbs, of natural ways to support your dog's body and whatever issue you may be struggling with. So some of the active ingredients in this are Taurine, of course, l carnitine which helps the metabolism of fats, EPA and DHA, which are fatty amino acids again, so they are going to help with not only the skin and coat and things like that, but heart health and how that actually, the heart functions and the strength of it and things like that. And then um, another one called coenzyme Q Q10, I always get it mixed up. Um, but all these things are going to be a great way to help boost the taurine and the metabolism of taurine in your dog's body. So if you are worried about it again, there is a supplement specifically for it. The next one is going to be raw goat's milk. I didn't bring it down here because I didn't want it to start thawing as we were talking and stuff. But raw goat's milk is a superfood supplement. Um, it is going to have, it's a natural probiotic. So going to help strengthen the gut and help heal the gut, but it also has things in it that are like cinnamon and turmeric that we carry the brand specifically. And those are natural anti-inflammatories. So we're able to lower the inflammation throughout the whole body and with the heart in general too. Yeah, and goat's milk is also a natural fiber, fiber leveler. So we talked about fiber a lot relating to the total uptake in the colon especially. So if you have a good level of fiber, fiber, then it's going to actually in, 
increase the taurine amount in the body. So that's another thing I really thought about. Yes. Um, one of the other ones that we have that's actually one of my favorite supplements I've been recommending to people is this pure krill formula. So krill is actually one of the highly most digestible forms of omega fatty acids. Um, the body breaks it down a lot easier than even fish oils. So some of the other things that are in here, so the omega fatty acids are going to serve as energy for the heart, muscles, and organs. They have antioxidant properties and help support a normal inflammatory response is what those fatty acids are good for. It also has choline in it, important for memory, muscle function, and liver health. We talked about how the liver breaks down everything and processes it, if we can have a healthier liver too, healthier body in general. Um, again, most effective way of getting those fatty acids is by krill because it's easily digestible. And then it also, I always mess this one up, astaxanthin? Is that how you say it? Astaxanthin? Okay. Um, it is an antioxidant and that helps fight off free, ra free radical damage and then also that can turn to support overall being and just health in general. So this has been a supplement I've been recommending to a lot of people. Those fatty acids are also really good for brain development, eyesight, and skin and coat for a normal healthy skin and coat response. So. And we did show on the DCM what causes DCM, a part of it was inflammation, right? So anything anti-inflammatory is going to benefit the heart, and that's what the krill oil is really good about. Any omega-3 is, but we find the krill is the most, it, the best way to deliver it to your dog. And also notice everything we've recommended is an animal product. We really try to choose animal products over plant products because animal products are easier to digest, they're better for carnivores in general, so we really try to stay on that side of the scenario. Um, so another great thing is CBD. CBD has so many benefits to it, but some of the biggest ones and for this issue specifically is CBD contains anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, antihypertensive, and vascular stabilizing properties. I want to go over that one again. Vascular stabilizing properties. So all for that heart health. So keeping that heart stable and functioning the way it should, CBD is going to work hand in hand with that. Um, it can produce better blood circulation. And so, as Ali talked about with the hose and the blood pressure and circulation throughout the whole body, CBD will help the natural pathways of blood to continue the way they should be. It can also help current heart disease through its vasorelaxant property. So, again, super heart friendly and lowers the inflammation throughout the whole entire body as well as the heart specifically and for those dogs who are already in this condition or have heart disease. Okay, so this last side, slide was something that I felt was super important. Of talking about our dogs, we want to give them the best life possible. And that doesn't have to mean it's an all or nothing thing. That doesn't mean you have to switch to a fully raw based diet. Whatever you are able to do in multiple different categories is going to be very beneficial for your dog. So that could mean small lifestyle changes all around can benefit them. Like I said, even just adding in one to three meals a week of raw, adding in a couple supplements or treats, ways to benefit your dog's body all around is going to be a great thing. But one of the things I've recently learned is five to ten minutes of breathlessness, heart thumping exercise can lower inflammation throughout the whole body, increase heart strength, and slow down the aging process drastically in dogs. And this specifically came from Karen Becker in her new book, The Forever Dog Book. And so even just five to 10 minutes, whether that be that heart pumping exercise, you're throwing a ball, your dogs are playing in a yard, that is increasing your dog's age span by an average of two years. And we want as many years as we can with our dogs. So. That's a really great thing. Another thing that you can do yeah. to just build your dog's bowl and increase their health is there's a lot of household things that we specifically use as humans that your dogs can have. So one of them, a huge one, is actually eggs. Eggs are the most highly digestible protein, so you can crack a whole raw egg, whole raw egg on top of your dog's diet. We sell duck eggs here, and they're a little bit more, they have a little bit more of those fatty acids again, and then a little bit thicker, so dogs tend to really like them. Yes. So not cooked, but raw. Yes. Yep. But is there fat? 
it's not necessarily bad as long as you're not having any of those like added sodium or spices okay. so and like the oil. Egg, like yes. The baby's soft web or something, that's still good. Okay. Absolutely, still good. Just any any sort of processing or cooking will always deplete the nutrition in some form or way. Even our freeze dried, about 5% of the nutrients are lost simply from processing. So cooking, you're going to lose a little bit, but if your dog prefers cooking, it's better to have a cooked egg than no egg, is what we would say. I think the hardest thing is that you kind of equate human to dog. So yes. like we are so ingrained in being careful with raw or surfaces that have that, and then we're giving this to the dog and we're going, oh, wait. <laughs> no, absolutely. But it is important to know that your dog is literally built and to I digest raw. And I think raw. we don't process it that way, uh, so that's yeah. a new thing that I never even thought of. But they're yeah. built differently. Yeah, they have. They can withstand that. Yeah, they have a whole set of enzymes that specifically protect them from yeah. things. They have a short digestive system, so things get in and out really quick. They absorb as much, so bacteria doesn't fester in there. They are that literally from head to toe built to handle these things. And we have to be careful on our end, right? Like you don't want to be giving raw eggs and not cleaning the bowl ever. Right. But yeah. your dog is not going to get salmonella in a negative yeah. way. Yeah. And yeah. that's why I've never given my dog yeah, no, and we, we always awesome. do. Yeah, <laughs> we have a lot of customers who think that way, and I thought that way before I learned so much, right? That's why, like, I think vegan diets are starting to become a thing because a lot of people are vegan, but people forget, like, dogs and cats are carnivores. Yeah. So there's 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 issues that can come from that thought of mine, but I'm really glad that you're learning this kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, it's so beneficial. I'm so happy. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. And like another thing is they can eat that whole entire shell too. The shell has a membrane in it that is extremely high in glucosamine that's going to help with the hips and joints. And so just making sure like if you ever do chicken eggs, it's the raw ground organic chicken eggs and yeah, you can continue okay, feeding the whole entire thing. So yeah, that's specifically for the shell. We don't feed white shells just because they've right. kind of been, yeah. they're usually in some sort of way either sprayed or yeah. you know, we just don't trust it. Um, but if you're feeding the inside, I feed white eggs. I still feed in the shell. Uh, yeah. yes. If you're wanting to feed the shell, you can grind it up. My dog will just eat it plain. Most dogs who are just barely introduced to it will be like, what are you trying to do? <laughs> but once a dog is used to it, they will be able to gobble it up. It's my dog's favorite mm -hmm. food on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and then other things like your household, some produce and fruits and vegetables, things like that. So. Um, Lisa here can testify for avocado. That's Barclay's favorite form of produce, and it's extremely good for heart health, immune system, as well as the skin and coat, and that's the fruit of the avocado. They cannot do the standard of a pit. Um, but avocados, as they start to get a little bit more brown, as your fruits and vegetables start to get to a point where you're like, mm, they're kind of on the mushy side, your dogs can eat those, and they benefit them in multiple ways. And so another big thing I want to kind of stress on is with these fruits and vegetables, steaming them is a really good way to introduce them into your dog's diet or blending them, specifically steaming, because they have this wall, plant enzymes do, that dogs can't break down as we've talked their carnivores. So when we steam them, it cooks them just a little bit enough to keep all the nutrients but break that plant wall down that now your dog is able to readily absorb them. And so they have a lot of benefits to them and you can start introducing those into your dog's diet as a way of even just starting raw fresh ingredients. So Yeah, so in general, animal protein, we want to be raw. They're made to, they're made to just digest that up. But then plant proteins, plant sources, we're gonna want to just process just enough to help them start that processing of absorbing it. Um, so we kind of divide those groups up. Yes. Awesome. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk on, and this is specifically one thing our trainer recommends, is what have you done today to help your dog in, there's three categories. So there's the mind, the body, and your relationship with them. Even just adding in five minutes to one of those categories a day is going to benefit your dog drastically and help with their overall health and lifespan. So, Mental stimulation is a great way to get them engaged, get those senses going. You can hide food and fruits and vegetables and things like that, and that's more stimulating to the brain than physical stimulation as well. So the more we can actively engage with our dogs and strengthen that relationship and their confidence, as well as benefiting their health and building a better goal, 
the better your dog is going to be overall and the better relationship you're going to have with them and your lifespan will be increased in that way. Yeah, we know stress affects the heart in a very negative way if it's chronic. So if your dog has chronic anxiety, if you can't take them out because they're just wired, um, these kinds of things, training will help, and that in turn will also help the heart. So as, that's kind of the holistic approach that we always take is the entire body, every category that influences your dog, not just nutrition, but also your relationship with your dog, and that's why we've introduced our training program as well, because it really does help with their internal health if they are confident and stress-free, which you also can get from our training program. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so the last thing on here that I wanted to talk about is we actually offer free nutritional consults here where you can bring your dog in and we can talk about whatever specific issues they struggle with or things you are worried about and we can actually formulate a whole diet specific to your dog's needs. So that is something that I do on a weekly basis where you can come in and pick my brain on anything. I usually consult with Ali on a few of them too to make sure that we're giving your dog the best overall approach. and to make sure it's a big difference of we are a store that cares for your pet's well-being. We are here to help them and to help you. So whatever you may need, we are here for that and that it ties right back into giving a free nutritional consult. So typically we do offer 10% off of any recommendations during our nutritional consult. For you all here today, if you do schedule a nutritional consult or at least get your name down, we will do 20% off of any of the items recommended for your nutritional consult. And so we just want to make sure that you know we are all here as TMP to help your animals to live the best life possible. So. All right. Thank you guys so much for coming in. <laughs> I understand it might be an information overload, so we're going to give you a little takeaway paper just so you can kind of go over the general points we made. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask us. If you, in a week, have a question, come in and you can ask any one of us. We're all certified in nutritional specialization. So thank you again, and we're going to hand these out. Do you have training classes? So we have a trainer here who, um, she does one-on-one -on -one classes. Um, and so, yeah, we do free evaluations for our training program every Wednesday where you can come in and meet with the trainer and kind of talk to her about what you're looking for. And from there, she can recommend a package to you of what would work best for your dog. And we do have a puppy package. So, yes, so, we do. So when you say a package, that would be like maybe a training class or a program. Yeah, so it would be, it would be usually it's like weekly over a certain amount of weeks and she gives you okay. what they go over yeah. and training. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. She's she's the best. She is such a Awesome. If you guys want, pull out those raffle tickets and maybe tell me like the last three numbers, and I'll shake them up, and then you guys can pick whichever one you want. What is your card? Okay, awesome. What is your guys' ticket? So we got zero one two and zero zero six.